So two weeks ago, I talked about the six transformations that we see going on. Um, that was the monetary and fiscal, the digital, the social and societal, climate, uh, geopolitical and political and education. And basically all those themes are uh, woven through the uh, recent G7 meeting. And, uh, you know, just want to start with what the agenda was and uh, for the meeting and give you a sense of how uh, uh, the G7 leaders were thinking about it. And just as a reminder, the G7 is uh, Canada, the US, the UK, France, Germany, uh, uh, Italy, and I'm missing one. I do this every time. Uh, Germany, Japan. Yeah. Japan, thank you. It was the other con continent. So uh, they were all focused on these six uh, areas. Uh, you know, how did we get the, the pandemic behind us and, uh, and what does it mean for future uh, uh, pandemics? Um, how do you get, how do you deal with the uneven economy and, um, and how do you put the money that's been spent to good use uh, and make sure we uh, have a more sustainable uh, growth trajectory after? Um, really, a lot of the undertone was around uh, uh, free and fairer systems and, you know, getting the tax system right and getting a, a more resilient global economy because the shocks of the last 15 years um, will be with us for some time, and they're concerned about the long-term scarring. And then, obviously, the uh, climate issue and, and dealing with the uh, items we've talked about here many times, but also really getting better global cooperation. And then, you know, what are the values of the world going forward? And, uh, you know, how many systems are we going to have? And how do, you, how do you deal with that? Um, our view of the real issues were you know, deficit spending versus austerity. And for Europe, this was such a big issue. And when you contrast what happened in 08 and how slow and how much infighting there was in the European community over austerity and the, and the budget uh, deficits and how far you could go and, and all that. And then you fast forward 15 years uh, and all of a sudden you're getting, you know, a very compelling case for expansive monetary uh, fiscal policy to support the monetary efforts. Now, it should be no surprise that Mario Draghi was one of the uh, supporters of it, given that he was on the other side as a central banker trying to deal with the problem. And I think one of the issues <clears throat> that we saw is that when you had austerity with um, really expansive monetary policy, you were missing the boat. You were only getting it half right. So there is this shift going on, and we think that's a big positive. Uh, that's one of the big issues, and that that actually puts... Um, the developed world, certainly the G7 nations, on a more consistent path forward uh, to make use of the spend. The other big issue is this uh, view of the democratic versus autocratic models. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting that you have, um, you know, President Biden really taking a similar tack towards China that uh, President Trump did. But the big shift is he's trying to do it in a more collaborative fashion. I found the Chinese uh, embassy comment uh, interesting because it just shows you how, how the different views of the world are. Um, you know, this exposed the sinister intentions of a few countries. And when they listed the U.S., they meant specifically the U.S., not including. And then you have this battle of now are we going to have uh, the, the G7 Belt and Road versus the Chinese Belt and Road programs. And, and another really interesting comment um, when we're talking about climate change in here, which is one of the big issues, uh, you know, the, the comment was uh, the world's richest democracies have responded with a plan to make a plan, uh, expressing the frustration of one of the architects of the Paris Agreement. And then you get to vaccine distribution and they're talking about doing at least 870 uh, million doses to be sent around uh, the rest of the world, uh, particularly to help the developing areas. And I believe the number that I uh, read was that they actually need uh, 11 billion. Uh, so not quite getting us where we need to get to with that effort. And I think that's one of the views that a lot of people have is did we come up a little short here? I've showed this chart before and it's, it is fascinating, but um, you know, we've thrown a lot of money at the problem and we have 
a really distorted monetary policy right now to try and give the fiscal policy time to work to deal with these major <clears throat> problems that the world is facing and that the world needs to tackle right away, whether it's climate, whether it's the uneven recovery, whether it's getting past the pandemic. We've thrown a lot of money at the problem. The question is, do we get the return for it? Or what are we left with if we don't, uh, which is going to be high debts and uh, little growth if we don't get it right. The other thing, and I, uh, apropos of the conversation we were just having, um, Johns Hopkins had their site um, for vaccination rates. And what was interesting when you look at it, the UK and the US, um, uh, according to Hopkins, are really pretty far along. Uh, but the rest of the world is really not getting it. Europe has, you know, 20% and plus in most of the major nations there. Um, but you're looking at China at, you know, 15% or so. Canada is trying to uh, make a bigger move and they've been moving up quite a bit. But you get to Japan and, um, you know, Russia. These are not good numbers for, uh, you know, large nations and top, you know, 10 economies or top 12 economies. Uh, the South Korean numbers were not available, but this is kind of concerning as to where we are and uh, what we have to do to still get the rest of the world vaccinated. And as I just said, I, I don't think the commitments from the G7 are going to be enough to get us there by a wide margin. And then the other element of it, and we didn't touch on this, is will we need boosters uh, coming in the fall for those who've been uh, fully vaccinated? And what does that do to supply and how do we get the numbers up? So, you know, the the counter to the Belt and Road, you know, build back better. Uh, it's a build back better world is the B3W. Um, we're trying to get support behind uh, initiatives that the U.S. is trying to lead. Um, that creates challenges and problems, particularly given the differences of administrations from uh you know, the Biden administration to the Trump administration or vice versa, but how different the approaches were in some respects. But it's also fascinating that uh, when it comes to China and Russia, President Biden is taking a lot of the same uh, path that the Trump administration took. But we think the bigger issue is really this battle for tech supremacy, whether it's here in space, whether it's cyber or military with drones, those are the big issues. And all this is going on against the backdrop of, you know, serious political instability in a lot of places. Um, you know, I'm reading that, you know, the food crisis that really pushed a lot of the Arab Spring uh, forward is coming back in a, in a big way as you have some food scarcity and inflation issues. Forced displacement is now over 80, um, was over 80 million people by mid 2020. And uh, that seems to be continuing and you know the issue of failed states was not addressed here but you know what do you do with Lebanon where they have gas lines now that are hours to get uh, rationed on gasoline um, you have the Syrian state that is a complete mess and you have all these shifting alliances in uh, in the system so I think there's a really fascinating uh, period that we're going through so just some closing thoughts that they had on it was uh, you know, President Biden's America's back at the table and we're going to be leading the world. Um, I think that was met with some enthusiasm, but also a lot of skepticism as uh, quoted by the European diplomat. You know, what are we looking for coming out of that? And then, you know, the summit has been marked by fantastic harmony um, is a great line. But I think there's a lot of skepticism about uh, where's the beef from this event. Um, I would add that the NATO meeting really was a uh, a call out of uh, the NATO versus Russia and NATO versus China. And what does that mean? And I think from uh, China and Russia and Iran, they're kind of shrugging this off right now. So they're waiting to see where the teeth is going to be in this. And just yesterday, there were China had 28 fighters and nuclear armed bombers uh, flying into the Taiwan air defense uh, identification zone yesterday, which is the largest uh, uh, flyover that they've had to date. So uh, clearly a response to the meeting when, when the NATO meeting was going on. And uh, I think it's setting up for a very bifurcated global, uh, global world from a political and economic perspective. And that's going to have big implications for particularly the future of Africa, uh, but also 
where does uh, Europe play and how do they play that? Because uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I think uh, trade and activity, China and the US are almost equal in terms of the benefits to Europe. And uh, this is going to set up for a very interesting couple of years. So I'll stop there, Mark, and uh, uh, turn it over to the group for their thoughts and comments. Great. Stephen, thoughts, yes. thoughts, comments? A first. Perfect. Well, one comment that I would have is the surprise of Japan and the poor vaccination rate there, especially given the, the eve of the Olympics. That, that's going to be quite fascinating because I know that there have been a series of riots and dissension on the ground because of the Olympics being held there, but I was unaware of how low that vaccination rate is. And I guess the numbers that Hopkins has seem to be a little lower than the ones you and Bill were quoting earlier, so Bill might have a comment on that. but. Either way, it's still not high enough for what, what needs to be done. Um, that's the, the takeaway I always take from these numbers, uh, particularly when you're pulling them from so many countries and trying to do it real time, is there's there is spreads in the accuracy. But I just look at the basic um, uh, proportions, and it is alarming. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's, the, what's, the, what's the, do you know the reason behind those low vaccination rates? Is it... Um poor rollout from the government? Is it um, lack of adoption from the, or skepticism by the public? What are the reasons behind that low adoption rate in Japan? Bill, do you have a thought on that? I, I think uh, it's primarily access in terms of, um, you know, kind of getting in line on the, on the queue, you know, with regard to vaccines, things like that. Uh, you know, we we heard sort of the, the tragic story of, of India, I think, the other week where, you know, Stephen, you've mentioned that you know, they shipped out, you know, a huge, huge supplies. But the reason why India didn't have access to the supplies that they were shipping out is because they were they were late in terms of actually putting their orders in. Yeah, so, I think that was the big problem for a lot of the countries. Canada had uh, a misstep on their ordering of supplies too. And I think, I just think governments were slow to really uh, react to the, to how big a problem this is. This was going to be back a year ago. And then we also had the disruptions of supply chains and, and the like through, uh, through the trade wars, but also through the uh, problems in uh you know, certainly through the U.S. and, and Puerto Rico in terms of how uh, uh, manufacturing of, of drugs was being done, too. So I think there's a I think this is kind of a collision of a lot of different issues all hitting at once. But I think a lot of governments just didn't plan well. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, I, had, I had a question. I had a question for Stephen and I guess whoever else in the group could address this. I mean, yesterday, uh, you know, the press conference, Joe Biden, it seems like he was asked some questions literally relative, you could say, to the health and the state of American democracy. And really, you could say there was a lot of even, you know, commentary on the punditry side about whether or not Europeans really are concerned about this idea of whether or not, you know, America is, you know, facing this idea of an auto, you know, autocratic you know, type of regime, you know, any thoughts on that? Or do you really think that that is something Europeans would be concerned about? I don't think that, I mean, China has highlighted the uh, civil unrest that's occurred in the U.S. I, I don't think our, you know, democracy converting to, auto, to an autocratic is the issue. I think the real issue is how does the world face off to, um, China and their aspirations because they they don't want to be equal. They want to be uh, President Xi's stated goal is for China to be the world's leading nation. Um, and with the hundred year anniversary, they are fully focused on that. Um, so their view is is they can get away with a lot right now, and they're going to try and do it. I think what the issue that um, that most people are facing is the U.S. versus or the Western world and 
that form of democracy versus what China and Russia and uh, and even the you know what's going on in Iran and how which model wins. And I, I don't think either one wins. I think they're both going to be kind of in a constant state of uh, trying to deal with each other. Uh, Stephen, you yeah. mentioned inflation in the Arab world. Um, do you have any updated views on inflation in the U.S.? I saw reports about like, you know, how used car indices are showing inflation, home prices are showing inflation, but like the Fed still thinks, you know, it's not too high of an inflation with their indicators. Yeah, or um, it is definitely heating up and it, sh it should because of all the money that's being unleashed on the system and the, the reopening provides a lot of spending power. Um, you know, it's interesting for all the focus on the inflation up, lumber has come down 40% in basically a month. Um, we think there's some, um, uh, there'll be some more permanent inflation, but overall we think that uh, supply, supply will catch up to demand in a lot of areas. And that's what you're seeing, particularly in commodity prices. Uh, supply will always catch up to demand if the prices are high enough and there's enough demand you can produce. Um, and the, re, the ability to be reactive is quite, quite, quite strong. I think the other issue is people will, will satisfy their spending desires and that pent up demand to spend will be set, uh, satisfied. And then you'll move back to a, a, a more normal kind of economy. It should be higher because we've been artificially low for a while. Uh, but for us, the big issue is the wage bill. And, and that will take time to see how that plays out. Um, but that is really uh, what we're seeing is a big increase in spend for productivity wow. and tech spend is a percent of of um, uh, GDP is actually rising to a pretty high level, which means a lot of money is going to be more productive uh, to more to try and create uh, higher productivity. And I think for for our view, we're sticking with the transitory, although uh, you have to be uh, open minded to the changes. Um, we're not there yet. Um, we think that uh, a lot of this will be satisfied and you'll get a more normal environment. There's too many distortions in the economy to, to feel confident that it's going to stay one way or the other. Uh, but our leaning is to transitory still. Yeah, Stephen, I, I, I guess I, I, would, I would add too, you know, as long as economic growth, you know, continues, it, it would be, you know, quote, normal, you know, for inflation to come back a little bit, you know, rates to rise. I think that, you know, one of the, um, Canaries that we need to watch is uh, is is how how that growth rate continues and if it begins to taper off, and then also if uh, you know if interest rates rise disproportionately to inflation, and you know as such you get kind of an effective tightening uh, on on the economy, you know that mm -hmm. that would that would not be a good sign, you know there. Yeah, and it, it is interesting to see the 10-year drop as much as it has down to below 150 in the face of these big inflationary concerns. And we, and our, our view is that, that what you've had is an artificial economy for over a decade, and that creates a lot of distortions in the system. And you kind of have to not be too reactive in this. And our take is it's very tough to, you, know, you either have to be an excellent trader or take a longer term view on where you're gonna invest your assets. Because I, I do think what's coming out of uh, the G7 and these other areas is they're highlighting the world has major problems and not enough money right now to solve them all. Um, so it's gonna take longer to deal with that, which in our view keeps a lid on inflation as well, because everyone, even with the proposals from the administration, that spend of the trillions of dollars that they want to do for infrastructure and everything else will be somewhat front loaded, but will be over several years too. So mm -hmm. we think you, you can't overreact to the short term uh, pressures, but you have to be very vigilant. Um, and if we see wages where companies are starting to report much higher uh, compensation lines, that's going to be an issue. But, you know, to Bill's point, we have an awful lot of debt in the global economy. Um, and uh, that's gonna uh, that has to be uh, have low rates and higher growth 
to be able to be managed without a real issue developing. And so it's going to be something you have to be on guard for. The other thing is the rate of change. And when you think about what happened last, uh, you know, in the last six months, you had the tenure go from, you know, 90 to 160 in a, in a blink of an eye. And so for us, it's really how fast or slow is the rate of change in interest rates and uh, in debt levels in GDP. And you really have to keep an eye on those, those uh, areas because we had a, a really sharp move up. Uh, but if you have a normal, more gradual drift up in inflation, interest rates and growth rates, then that's certainly manageable. Yeah. You know, the same, same thing happened, you know, further out the curve as well. You know, the 30 year, you know, jumped up, you know, proportionally and and recently, you know, has also come, you know, come back down. And, you know, ironically, when we had that uh, that strong inflation number last week, <laughs> bonds bonds rallied <laughs> that, that day. So, you know, I I think and Stephen, I think you, you've mentioned this before. September is going to be really key. With all the you know federal subsidies you know coming off at that point, because yeah. clearly the amount of disposable income that consumers have right now because of all the stimulus uh, has has been a, a large few you know a large amount of fuel you know for the inflation we've seen so far. But when that comes off, and again, seems kind of going back to your point in terms of of wage growth, it could very well be that at that stage. Of, of time, people will realize that like, hey, you know, I actually do have to look, you know, for more meaningful work. And then it, you know, rather than being a, uh, the, the, the advantage being to job seekers, um, it's now, you know, gonna be to companies. Yeah, incentives work both ways, right? So when you take it away, you'll have a lot more people much eager to, figure out how they're going to pay for things. And uh, and that will make a difference. But there's still the skills mismatch that has to be addressed too. So just because people want jobs doesn't mean they can get them either. So uh, there's got to be a lot of changes going on with that that we're going to have to deal with. Um, and that's really one of the big issues is for all the money that we've spent uh, globally to deal with the problem, has that spend is, are we going to get the return on that and uh, in what areas? And I, I believe that you'll see companies get a better return on their spend than the government's will, and that's going to help them be more productive, but it also shifts the dynamics for employment. And it may start to really push for a lot of new business creation going on, which is good for, it's a big part of the US. And I think we'll see small business creation start to pick up and create new jobs and new markets. And and that's the thing that's lost in the digital transformation for many is when you're, when you're having all these changes going on with technology, it creates big new total addressable markets and, uh, and really uh, changes the job outlook as well. So I think that's, that's uh, going to be a big factor. And I think you're right, Bill. September has a lot of elements to it because at that time, I think you'll also see a lot of people starting to go to work full time or back to their offices and all that. And that changes the dynamics of economies and cities and, and how things are, are moving forward as well. So I, there'll I think also be really a big impact. There'll also be a big impact of people going back to, to school at the same time and all the employment. And, and since most of the schools are requiring their students to be vaccinated, you know, you're talking about, you know, all of the, the activity and even, you know, the service jobs and stuff like that that are going to be connected with them. Yeah, I also think it's easy to say you're not going to go back into an office since you've been remote, and that's not going to—that's not what you want. Um, I think what you're hearing from the big companies right now is that's interesting, but you're going to be back to work if you're comfortable going to a bar or restaurant. You should be comfortable going to the office. Uh, you know, I think John uh, Gorman said that yesterday from Morgan Stanley as part of his. Uh, rationale for getting back to work. And it does help the cities and it will help a lot of businesses when we start to continue to open up. And we saw it in Ohio when we were out there, you know, you're seeing people in a, it's a very different mindset. Um, and, you know, I, I talk to the folks in, in Toronto a lot. 
they're they're bordering on depression. They can't wait to get back and get out and uh, and start to move. And I think that's uh, I think we're in that mode right now. So it's going to be interesting to see come September how how our worlds have changed. And uh, I think that'll be the big time that you see a lot of these things. And and you'll have a better sense of what's real and what's what was transitory. Stephen, yes, Stephen, just to kind of. Um echo some of your comments there, you know, the digital transformation of cybersecurity has really kind of been at the forefront of just the pandemic in, in general. But, uh, um, you know, a lot of the CEOs that, uh, you know, have been talking lately on different uh, channels or different uh, uh, exposés or opinions within uh, uh, different websites are citing that their, their skill sets internally are not ready for what they have to do. And they know they have to get there in the digital transformation space. On the work back to work front, um, cybersecurity attacks have dramatically increased during the pandemic, but it also has repositioned the attacks at the home front instead of the corporate uh, because it's a much easier entry point. And uh, not only that, there's complications going back into office because being away from your home office where you get updates uh, consistently in a safe way internal to your organization is a big challenge right now for a lot of companies. So they're trying to figure out how to deal with that as well before they bring a lot of uh, uh, people back into the office. Yeah, I don't know if you saw Brian Moynihan on CNBC yesterday, but he was talking about the spend for, for Bank of America. And he thinks it's pretty similar for all the big banks is they're looking at, uh, you know, $500 million a year on cyber alone. And uh, that's come up considerably. And that's just those guys. You'd multiply that out by all the corporations shifting their spend there. And you can identify where the opportunities are coming from all the problems we're trying to address. And you can have some really good investments from that that don't have to rely on trading. You can really take a secular view, you know, think of the secular problems and you can invest in them and make and do quite well. Uh, so, Joe, do you want to um, say I want to chime in really quick. Um, we have a philanthropies event tomorrow at 11. It's about a girl's education. So it has a special guest component and it has a forum component where you could openly discuss uh, your thoughts on a girl education. Maybe you're involved with uh, uh, organizations or projects. Uh, the special guest, uh, her name's Tracy. She's been supported by the UK and the Jordanian royal families. Um, basically what she did, she was the first one to lead an all-woman team to do a global sailing race that's usually done by men. And she also has some celebrity supporters like Whoopi Goldberg and whatnot. So I hope you could join us tomorrow. It's on the same uh, 361 Zoom link. Yeah, I would just add, we, we've uh, recently published our latest outlook. And uh, Sean, if you can, can you pop that into the uh, chat uh, so people can pull it down? Uh, and we write these supposedly four to six times a, or six to eight times a year, but I've been having some writing problems. I think the, uh, the weekly updates have been a distraction, but uh, uh, if you want to get added to our distribution list when you receive, if you pull this down, just reach out to either Sean or myself and we'll get you added to that. Uh, this is our second one this year, um, but uh, we cover a lot of the uh, things we talk about here, but it's a little, it's a little different. Uh, so, Stephen, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you touched on something saying, hey, that there's too many problems globally and not enough money to solve the problems. So just like, is this the new normal of, hey, are we just now, you know, is this, are we always going to live in this world of, you know, monetary easing and, and, and stimulus or, you know, or are we expecting innovation to kind of plug this gap over time and growth to plug this gap or like how, how are we transitioning and and i feel in so many ways markets are just addicted to this easy money so how do we kind of like unwind and, and end up in a situation where we can actually have enough capital to solve the global problems that we're facing if the only way you solve the you can resolve this joe is with growth and effective spend when the governments are putting the money out and and it has to be I, I, my view is you can't solve them all at once um, so you got to kind of knock them off, you know, two at a time, something like that, because if we're trying to take advantage, you know, solve all these issues and, you know, that you look at the vaccines, we should, you know, I would start with that one first and really ramp up our vaccination process so you can have a healthy, a healthier economy. Um, and then 
you know, even the support that they're talking about for uh, helping, you know, the African nations out who, or the uh, developing nations that are not are not getting the support or have much deeper problems. Uh, we're just not doing what, you know, we're not getting effective spend out. So I think the way you get out of this is you have to narrow down the things you're trying to solve and make your spend more effective and kind of knock them off one at a time. Uh, the climate one is one that you have to chip away at. Um, I think they're putting a lot of pressure on companies to do that. But if you can't solve that, if you don't get China on board, uh, you can only minim you can work to minimize it. But I think the number China is introducing more coal fire plants, new ones this year, than all the coal uh, output of Europe currently. That's not, we can't get there if they're going to keep putting, uh, you know, highly pollutant plants up and, you know, the rest of the world's trying to, you know, do it. There's certain things are global and certain things you can solve locally. And I think the countries themselves have to really make sure when, if the U.S. does a big infrastructure program, you don't water it down so you don't get the bang for your buck. Because that's the problem is if you have big problems, you got to solve them in a big way. And if it was a company, you would treat it a lot different than the government would. But, but companies aren't trying to get reelected. They're just trying to solve problems and, and create revenues and create growth. Uh, so it's a very different approach. I think governments have to have a more corporate mindset. And to that end, we've always advocated that you split the budget between an operating budget and investment budget. And if you manage the investment budget the way a corporation would with what's the return on the investment, it gives you a better sense of how you can justify spending more and not getting into the debate that, you know, the parties have had in the U.S. And I think you've seen between parts of Europe with other areas of Europe, the ones that are doing well versus the ones that aren't. So it really comes down to effective spend for the money that we've put out. Um, will we get past it? I don't know, Joe. It's it's going to be a harder it's going to be hard to wean people off the free money. Steve, just on the, I saw the one thing that we can, that was agreed upon is that, is that there is an infra infrastructure bill potentially passing uh, and I getting attacked by the right and the left, but could happen. What's your view on that? Uh, again, they can't solve them all with the bill, with the bill we're putting out. So what are we going to focus on? Um, if you dilute it too much, you just don't get, you don't get the value for it. And even in the, in the G7, they were talking about putting out, you know, helping, a, sending a, uh, up to a billion dollars or trillion dollars over some period to developing nations when the, their infrastructure needs for the developing nations are $40 billion or $40 trillion. I mean, sorry, they were going to give a trillion dollars to developing nations when they have a $40 trillion problem. So that scale is out of whack. Um, so I don't know how you solve that one uh, easily. And, and certainly that's gonna require not governments alone, but this is where corporations really have to play a role. Yeah, and then, and Stephen, just to kind of add on to that point too is, it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Biden administration also has expanded uh, the coverage of the infrastructure to more the digital space as far as the cybersecurity infrastructure, which they've done large amounts of investments in, in the recent, most recent executive orders and directives. Yeah, they've added, they've added cyber, they've added space to it. Um, you know, they're adding uh, broadband and then they're putting in, uh, and this is the big debate of the human infrastructure versus the physical. Um, so it's, you know, we're, we're trying to solve a lot. And, you know, the populist movement came around in, in large part because of austerity, but also in large part because people weren't getting their, what their items were addressed. And, and that's led, led to this really divided view because what works for some people is not a need for others. And, you know, we're going to have to figure out what's most important and, and address it. And uh, cyber is one for the for the developing, for the G7, uh, that the bad actors are, are really good. Um, they're good at what they're doing and it is highly disruptive and it can undo the growth trajectory that we're trying to create. Uh, when you shut down, we saw with the Colonial Pipeline and that was a short-term issue, uh, how disruptive uh, supply chain or infrastructure or power grids, the disruptions to them are real. And, you know, Luke, you're right. That's where cyber comes in in a big way. And we have to figure out a better way to shut it all down. 
Uh, I do I think that that we did take a you know get some of that money back is sending a different message that the uh, cyber criminals are going to have to up their game. Adam, yeah, but Luke, um, I, I would think that too when you're talking about that. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. Interest. He, Adam had his hand up a while ago, and I, and I right. okay. Just hold, hold your thought. Got your thought? All right, Adam. Now, Adam goes goes away. Okay, back to you, Lauren. Sorry, Luke. Uh, what I've heard though is that that's in a sense when you're talking about the infrastructure, that's where a lot of the pushback is. Is that some of the folks that want to kind of like limit it or trim it, trim it, are kind of having this idea of how do you define infrastructure? You know, does broadband? You know, I mean, I think it does, but you know, does broad? You know, do you include broadband inside? You know this idea of interest infrastructure and certainly you know do you include uh the you know so to speak human infrastructure and the accusation is that that's just a kind of like a a securitous route to try to get to some of the other like you know, could say spending priorities that you know that the let's say progressive side has so i mean how do you think all of that like works out are they ever going to really resolve that and be able to really define what quote infrastructure in the 21st century is? Well, I think it's an ever evolving uh, kind of moving target. You know, it's, it's just a play on uh, what we all been taught has been infrastructure now has kind of morphed into more a digital space and it all is important. And uh, I think probably, you know, different section or uh, uh, sectors of uh, uh, the economy and different uh, government government level directed um, policies probably have uh, kind of contributed to the stagnation of uh, moving towards that direction. And now all of a sudden it's just all upon us and it's amplified with the, uh, the pandemic and it's kind of front and center. We, we can't avoid it at this point. We have to do something about it. And I think it's just, a, uh, again, a sheer amount of change all at once uh, that Stephen kind of alluded to. Um, and I think it's all playing in the same direction and the back and forth between trying to define what infrastructure is, is just something that we as a country have to go through politically um, until we get to the point where we can see some movement and then people kind of start jumping onto the bandwagon to say, yeah, this is something good. So I think you're just going to, it's just something we have to go through, but I think it, as long as the pressure's up above uh, kind of pushing and then supported underneath by directed investments in these specific areas, we're going to get through it, but it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the, one of the interesting things is if you look at what the States do well and what the government, what the federal government does well, the federal government can be a financing mechanism for this, but execution has to happen in, in on the ground. And that's where the states are, are better able to do it. So finding a better relationship between the how the money gets spent and gets distributed down and, and how it gets productively used, it's generally not the federal government doing a great job in productive spend. What they do is they do a great job in helping research and finance some of this stuff. You know, when you think about our big technology advances, they came through the federal government and others that, um, and corporations partnering together. And, and you're seeing that in, in big way in the cyberspace where uh, a lot of the best stuff comes out of startups and, uh, and the uh, bigger defense companies working in tandem with the government to solve problems. And I think that uh, is really what you have to define is who does what better and where does it go? Um, and and that gets down to all the elements of the spend. But I just think we're trying to solve every problem that's uh, ever come up all at once. And that's not practical. Agreed. Stephen, um, along the lines of growing out of this situation, you had mentioned earlier correct me if I'm wrong, that there is an expectation of um, new business creation yep. coming up. What, what industries, what sectors are you, are, are, is your expectation those new business creations? Is it digital? Is it cybersecurity? Is it manufacturing? What sectors in particular? 
And, and I'm assuming these, these new business creations are small business, medium-sized businesses, correct? Well, yeah, you know, uh, you, you have two elements. Start with um, big companies are redefining themselves. So they are either parsing off um, uh, parts of the business that are low growth, low return businesses, and yeah. uh, they're getting housed in places that are better suited for them and fit and, and get better growth. And I think uh, JP Morgan was out yesterday. Jamie Diamond was suggesting that they're going to have the best quarter in of M&A that maybe they've ever had uh, coming up. So there's that element of it where you're having these spinoffs of, of businesses that are going on, a lot of M&A activity. But you do have, whenever there's a crisis coming out of the crisis, small business creation rises and it re- rises out of the need because people lost their jobs and they're forced to find something new to do. Um, I think if you're starting that today, unless you have a very unique angle on an existing business, like a better way to do retail, um, I think you're going to see it in the areas where you're going to have, where digitalization can win, where they can drive down costs and you can offer a better value. So I think that's going to be, you're going to see a lot of money go into cyber, but that's regardless of new business or existing business, they all have to spend on cyber. I think you're going to see uh, digital process automation, the use of artificial intelligence and blockchain technologies and the like to lower whatever you can lower cost to compete in a world where um, you have either labor scarcity or higher input costs and you have to force your costs down to compete. That's the areas where you're going to see new business creation uh, coming out. You're seeing it in digital advertising versus traditional advertising. You're seeing it in how some retail stores adapted like Dunkin' Donuts and, and others to, to really reducing their in-store headcount by creating more drive-through, more automation, more use of digital apps and the like, and delivery services. So I think you're going to see changes to how kind of legacy businesses work versus how new business startups. But then I, mean, I would suggest nobody wants to be, you know, a, a big box retailer anymore, or, you know, some of those things. So I think there's a lot of changes going on there that you're going to see. But I think small business startups will come in healthcare in all the big problem areas, cyber, health, uh, you you name it, where, where we need to do it. And I, I do think a lot of the themes that we talk about, whether it's private or public, uh, will all play out. Um, and then it's just, you know, balancing that. But what's going on in healthcare is phenomenal. You know, what we've done over the last 15 months in innovation in healthcare is, I think, the tip of the iceberg for what we can do to lower healthcare costs. And, and you know, it used to take 10 years to create a drug and get it approved. We did it in 15 months and the efficacy is higher. I think you're going to see more innovation drive every industry. And the ones that don't are going to be left on the side of the road. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a comment, Steve. I had a question. Do you think it's wise to invest in the companies like Levi Strauss would invest in the companies that are supplying the small businesses? So the ed tech companies, the ag tech companies, like companies that are educating people on how to be a business owner or how to be an entrepreneur or how to upskill yourself. I think that's the mass opportunity. I just wanted to get your opinion on that versus the companies that are saving costs. That's, that's, you know, I think about it. I'm investing in companies that are saving costs because they're, they're losing margins because they're competing on price. Or do I invest in companies that are reskilling 3 billion people? Maybe I'm answering my own question, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I do think there are some companies that are lowering their input costs, creating more opportunities so that they can reinvest more to create new markets. So, you know, uh, I, I think there are new market opportunities developing whenever you have problems and big transformations like we're going through. You see a lot of innovation and new businesses come out of that. But I also think there are some businesses that can reinvent themselves well uh, if they pivot early enough. Um, You know, I think the ones that pivot late, look at General Motors as an example of, you know, from bankruptcy, which was absolutely helped them and gave them a big uh, leg up over their competitors who had the legacy pension costs and the other things, but they also were early to pivot to EVs. So if you can make the pivot, you can win. Um, if, you're too, if you're too slow or too late, I mean, certain businesses, it doesn't matter what you do. So I, I agree with you there. Um, 
but there are, you know, industries that are reinventing themselves. How corporate travel works, I can tell you, is going to change considerably because uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and the the applications of AI for digital process automation are going to flow through a lot of industries, and I think that's going to create different business models for existing businesses. And then at the same time, I think we're going to have things like we didn't have before, you know, the the next Ubers and the like that um, can change things as we move forward. So I think it's a combination of both, but I do think there are just some industries or companies that are not in a financial position to affect the change. Um, They're too highly indebted. Uh, Their capital goes to debt servicing. If they have a rise in interest rates, um, they're going to uh, be unable to effectively invest to make the transition. And I think those companies will be left on the side of the road. Uh, but if you have strong balance sheets, good cash flows, and you make good investments, you can make the adjustment and transition. So I wouldn't say nobody's going to change that are existing. Um, but I think they, I think it takes good leadership uh, to do that. And I, I don't think that's as broad as I think it's like everything else. I think 20% of the companies probably have good leadership and a good model to move forward. Uh, 25% probably have either good leadership in the wrong model or the right model in bad leadership. And then there's a bunch of them that, you know, really are going to be stuck in nowhere's land until they figure out that they're in nowhere's land. Thank you. Well, one, one last question on that. Um, on the debt side, do you do you see a lot? I've noticed there's like 400 billion in new green bonds, they call it, or social bonds that companies are taking out. Do you see that? trend continuing where companies are taking debt out to retool themselves to go green or is that a big thing in your mind or i think the uh i think the esg movement the impact movement is going to force companies to do a lot of things that they wouldn't normally do um some of it will be for show and some of it will be because they're really trying to uh to make a change but i think some when i say some of it's for show i don't mean they're not well intended but they're going to have to answer to activists uh, and Exxon prove that, that nobody's exempt. And even large companies are going to have to make changes. But how much of those changes are cosmetic versus real, we'll know in uh, several years out. Thank you. Stephen, uh, another question here. Um, Which industries, apart from healthcare, do you see as being most vulnerable to disruption? Uh, well, to me, the one that's so, an example, so obvious revenue. to me is blockchain and yeah. titles in the U.S., right? The going through the process of buying a property and having to pay somebody to tell you that the house that the previous owner, it is actually their home. Um, blockchain would could basically wipe out that industry and and, you know, and do away with it. I think a lot of the insurance industry could be streamlined. Um, if anyone's had a really good mortgage experience, uh, you know, I'd love to hear about it because every time you try and refinance or do something else, the paper pushing the months and they say you need three months of, uh, you know, financial records. And then later on in the process, they tell you that they need updated on the three months because the process took too long. I think there's a lot of areas where, uh, you're going to see changes like that. 